Praise God. It's an honor to be here this morning. Are you guys excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Yes. Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Yes. I know the Lord has a word for you before the service. My iPad broke randomly. I just got up and, and the, the thing on the speaker broke. So how many know the devil can't stop what God has planned? But when you see things like that, you could just see that God wants to speak to us. Amen? So it's an honor to be here. I just want to thank my beautiful wife who's here this morning, Celeste. Um, my beautiful daughter, Winter's here. And we have Summer here who is our baby that's on the way. She should be here in the next two weeks. So um, I honor my family. Um, I just want to thank Pastor Josh for having my family here and, and for allowing the word of God to go forth through me. It's an honor and a privilege every time. I don't take it lightly that God can use somebody like me. It's a beautiful thing. And so let's just open up in a word of prayer before we get into this, this word that I feel like is, is special. Father God, we thank you for today. We praise you. We honor you. Have your way in this word, through this word. And I just pray, God, that you would speak to us today in a, in a special way. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Somebody say it's breakout time. Come on, say it's breakout time. So I want to I speak from the book of Acts, chapter 12, verse 1. And it says this. About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with the sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads, under the guard of four squads of four soldiers. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. But, everybody say but. But, but while Peter was in prison, the church prayed earnestly for Peter. The Bible says the church began to pray earnestly for Peter. And as the church prayed earnestly for Peter the night before his trial, because how many know we serve a God that shows up right in the nick of time? Peter's getting ready for his trial, so who knows what could happen to him? King Herod had just killed James, so Peter could be on his way to death. But Jesus shows up right in the nick of time. The believers, the family of God, the body of Christ shows up right in the nick of time. How many know it's important to have our brothers and sisters back in the Lord? That when they're going through something, when they're getting persecuted, when they fall, when they fail, when they're down. How many know when we pray earnestly for the family of God and for our brothers and sisters, something begins to shift? Somebody say it's a shift. A shift takes place when you pray earnestly. And so Peter's getting ready for his trial. The devil has it all worked out for Peter to be persecuted. And the devil has Peter captive and thinks that he's got Peter bound. But a shift takes place because the church decided to stand up. How many know the church needs to stand up in this generation? How many know the church needs to stand up in America? How many know the church needs to stand up and rise up against abortion? How many know the church needs to stand up and rise up against drug addiction? How many know the church needs to stand up and rise against prostitution, rise against human sex trafficking, because we stand for righteousness. And the Bible says that when the devil, when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard. And I don't know about you, but I want to be that standard that God raises up. God raises up a standard when the enemy comes in like a flood. So when the enemy comes in like a flood in your family, in your house, in this generation, in this culture, he's flooded this generation with perversion flooded this generation with all types of giants that are rising up against us and it's our time to rise up against those Goliaths and say I am the standard that God is rising up in this generation Amen. right Amen. for every Goliath there's a David Amen. I don't care what the devil thinks for every Goliath there's a David and I believe that God is raising up a generation that will stand up for his kingdom stand up for the ways of the Lord stand up for the truth amen and so the church decides to rise up the night before Peter was in trial. But I want to focus on that word earnestly because earnestly means to pray with sincere and intense conviction, 
Do I have any believers in this place that pray with sincere and intense conviction? Listen to me. I don't care what your age is in this place. You can have a prayer life that is on fire for Jesus till the day you die. You can have a prayer life that burns for God. You can have a prayer life that's full of conviction, that's full of passion, that's full of energy, that's full of life with Jesus until the day you die. Praise God for that. I praise God for that. I praise God that it doesn't matter my age. Young, when I was young, God set me on fire. And when I'm older, I believe that I'm going to burn for Christ even more because the Bible says we go from glory to glory to glory to glory, which means it gets better and better and better with Jesus. If it's getting worse for you, let me tell you something. It's not God's fault. If you don't feel that same passion and that same joy, you need to ask yourself, what has taken place? Because God didn't go nowhere. And God hasn't become less enjoyable. God has only become more and more enjoyable in my life, in my family, in my ministry. It's gotten better and better, and I've seen him move more and more. I was praying this morning in my house, and I woke up and began to pray, and I began to cry because I felt the love of God like I felt it the first time I ever encountered him. And I said, God, I thank you that with you it gets better and better and better. We don't go back in the kingdom. The word of God says he who puts his hands to the plow and looks back isn't fit for the kingdom. And I don't know about you, but I feel like I want to be fit for the kingdom. So I have no business looking back. I have no business talking about the good old days. This is the good old day right here, right now. I'm living in the great day right now. And with Jesus, the love grows greater. The love grows deeper, more fervent, and more passionate. That's just the God we serve. And so the church prayed earnestly for Peter right when he was about to be placed on trial. And the Bible says this, Peter was asleep in the prison, fastened with two chains. Somebody say, it's breakout time. Come on, tell your neighbor, it's breakout time. Fastened with chains. Between two soldiers, others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly, there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. I praise God that the, that the Lord is not afraid to shine light in our dark places. I praise God that the Lord is not afraid to shine light in the middle of my bondage. I praise God that he wasn't afraid to step right into the middle of my mess when I was 15 years old on drugs in San Jose, California. The Lord was not afraid to shine light in my prison cell. See, we got to get rid of that thinking that says you got to get right, you got to fix yourself up, you got to put on the right church clothes in order for you to encounter God. That's a lie from the pits of hell. Because God will step right in the middle of your bondage. God will step right in the middle of your mess and turn it into a message. God will step right into the middle of your darkness and light it up. He's not afraid of your sin. You know how I know? Because the prodigal son story. The prodigal son spent all of his inheritance, ran amok. Everybody else didn't believe him no more. He, he, didn't, he didn't believe in himself anymore. He just said, if I could just go back home and not even be my father's son, if I could just be a, a servant there at my father's house, and the father ended up running to him before he even got home because we serve a God who chases us down. We serve a God who pursues us. Even when we mess up, we serve a God who's still interested in us, a God who still wants relationship with us, a God who still desires us. Am I preaching to somebody in this place we serve a God who loves us Amen. suddenly there was a bright light in the cell right when Peter needed in that moment when he needed a touch when he needed something to happen maybe possibly dying the next day going to trial just seeing James get killed I came to tell you that revival shows up in the nick of time. Breakout shows up in the nick of time. And I praise God that God showed up in my life when he did because I was like Peter. 
I possibly could have died that day. I possibly could have died the next day. I possibly could have overdosed on the drugs that I was addicted to. But Jesus shows up right in the nick of time. He might not show up all the time when you want him to. He might not come through in in the time that you think that he should. But I came to tell you that he knows your situation and he'll show up right when he's supposed to. Anybody praise God that he saved you when he did? Is there anybody like me that says, I don't know if I would have made it if I went another day without Jesus? I don't know if I would have made it if I went another day without the Lord. Suddenly there was a bright light. And an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. And the angel struck him. Everybody say the angel struck him. See, sometimes we think God's always gentle and soft. Sometimes God wants to wake us up. Sometimes God needs to strike us to put us back in order. Sometimes God needs to strike us. Like, remember when Jacob got his blessing? The Bible says that Jacob wouldn't stop until he got his blessing from the Lord. And Jacob the, got his, his hip struck and Jacob's walk was changed forever. The Bible says that Jacob was never able to walk the same. And it sounds bad because, you know, he's probably walking with a limp. But it's actually good because everybody who looks at him is going to be like, what happened to his walk? His walk is different than it was before. That's actually a beautiful story with Jacob. It's a beautiful story because he never walked the same. And the Bible says that the angel struck him on the side to awaken him. And he said, quick, get up. Quick, get up. Somebody say it's breakout time. You've been in that prison long enough and the angel showing up right now in your life. And the angel saying, quick, get up. Quick, it's time to awaken out of that slumber. Quick, it's time to awaken out of that compromise. Quick, it's time to awaken out of that routine. Quick, it's time to awaken out of that addiction. Quick, it's time to wake up and God is waking up the body of Christ and God is striking us and saying it's time to awaken because when God shows up, it always brings forth awakening. When God shows up, it always brings forth awakening. Strunk up on the side and said, quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrists. Then the angel of the Lord told him, get dressed and put on your sandals. How many know you got to dress for the occasion sometimes? How many know you got to dress like you're free? How many know you got to dress like you're free? You got to dress for the occasion sometimes. And the angel was saying, get dressed. Because where we're about to go, you're not going to be bound no more. And the chains fell off. And he put on his sandals. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell, following the angel. But all the time, he thought it was a vision, and he didn't realize it was actually happening. This was too good to be true for Peter. This miracle was too great for Peter to believe. And it could speak to us today. And I came to declare over you and decree over you that what God is about to do in your family is going to be so miraculous that it will be too good to be true that you won't believe it at first. It will be so mighty. He's the God of the impossible. And it will be so great that at first you won't even believe it. Your mind won't be able to conceive what God's about to do in your grandchildren, what God's about to do in your sons and your daughters, what God's about to do in your ministry, what God's about to to do here at Portland Congregational Church. Your mind won't be able to grasp it because we serve a God who blows our minds. Amen. It'll be so mighty you won't believe it at first. Why? Because eye has not seen nor ear has heard the, what God has in store for those who love him. My God will do exceedingly and abundantly all we can ever ask or imagine. I came to tell you that my God will exceed your imagination. You give your life to Christ and just watch what he does with it. You'll be like Peter, not even believing. You'll think it's a dream. You'll think it's a vision. When I look at my family, when I look at my wife, when I look at my daughter, and I look at my daughter that's on the way, I I don't even believe it sometimes. God, how can you take a little drug addict kid from the streets of San Jose and bless me with the ministry, bless me with a beautiful family, bless me with a relationship with you? I can't believe it. I can't believe it sometimes. But that's because our God is too good to be true. But he is true, if that makes sense. So he didn't realize it was actually happening. Somebody pinched me. Man, 
our God is so good. Do you ever have those days? I'd be thinking, this is how I know God transformed my life. Because I went to a, I went from a hardcore, you know, drug addict to thanking God for trees and, and, and flowers. I'll be crying sometimes just looking at the flowers. And I'm like, man, what am I doing, you know? But that's how good God is. He opens your eyes. When you give your life to the Lord, you see things different. You see the beauty in all that he's created. You see the mighty, wondrous works. I like that, that, that song. When, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thine hand has made. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works that my hand, th- thine hand has made. Man, we got to see the beauty in the little things. Amen. That's why we're tripping off the big things sometimes. Because we can't even see the beauty in the small things. I caught a fish the other day and started crying when I got home because I was like, thank you, God, that I caught a fish today. (laughs) Only you could do that. (laughs) They passed the first and second guard post. So Peter's following the angel. Somebody say, follow the angel. angel. It's breakout time. Is there anybody breaking out this morning? I believe that by the time we walk out of those doors today, there's going to be some people that, that have broken out. And I don't know what it is. It could, it could be sin. It could be, it could be whatever it is. It could be routine. It could be a, a normalcy that maybe your relationship with God just hasn't been as passionate as it used to be. And God is saying, come back to the place. Break out of that routine and come back to the place where you're in love with me again, where you spend time with me again, where you pray earnestly again with fire and conviction. Come back to that place. I believe God's breaking some people out today. And if you don't believe, I'll believe enough for you. They passed the first and second guard post and came to the iron gate leading to the city. And this opened for them all by itself. I came to tell somebody today, when it's God, it'll open all by itself. When it's God, the gates will swing wide open all by itself. When it's God, the door will swing wide open all by itself. You don't got to go kicking down doors. You don't got to go trying to make a way for for yourself. The Bible says he's Jehovah Jireh, my provider. He'll make a way for me. I don't got to kick down doors. The doors will swing wide open for me. My promotion is found in God. My elevation is found in God. The next level is found in God. It's not found in me trying to work up all all, all these things that I can do to get me to the next level. Because the Bible says, promotion come not from the east, nor the west, nor the south, but only from the Lord. Elevation is only found in the Lord. That next level you're trying to tap into is only found in the Lord. And here's the scary thing, is when you don't let the doors open by themselves, and you kick, kick them down, and you try to make it happen in your own strength, Which, by the way, the word of the Lord also says, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. It's not by your might. It's not by your power. It's not your works. It's by the spirit, says the Lord. When you try to kick those doors down and you try to make things happen yourself, then what happens is you have to sustain yourself there in your own works. And you got to keep doing, doing, doing. And you have to sustain yourself in that position. But when you let the Lord swing the door open, his grace will sustain you there because his grace is enough. Amen? Amen. So they passed through and started walking down the street. And then the angel suddenly left him. Peter finally came to his senses. It's really True, he said, the Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. Recognize. I got a word for somebody today. Recognize. Recognize when something's God. Recognize when God blessed you. Recognize when God saved your grandchildren and saved your children. Recognize that it was only by the grace of God. Give him glory. Give him credit. Give him praise. Recognize that it was God. Sometimes God answers a prayer and then we start complaining about something else. Me and my wife were just talking about this last night. Some of the prayers we prayed in the last season, God has answered. And instead of praising him for what we prayed for in the last season, now we're trying to fix all the problems in this season. And we're finding all the faults in this season. That we can't even enjoy the victory. 
We can't even enjoy the victory that my little brother Rocky gave his life to the Lord. We prayed for that. Why don't you give the Lord a praise for that? Why don't you give the Lord a praise for what he's already done? Instead of constantly going and asking and asking and asking, why don't you say, God, I thank you for what you've already done. You've done enough for me to praise you. You've done enough for me to give you thanks. You've done enough for me to worship you. I thank you that you, got, that you gave me breath in my lungs this morning. Sometimes, sometimes I praise him on credit. I, I, I don't, you know what, Lord? This week, I know you're about to do something, so I'm going to praise you for what you're about to do because I have the faith that this week you're about to do another miracle. I have faith that this week you're going to come through financially for us again. I have faith that this week you're going to do it again in my life. I'll praise you on credit. You don't got to show me the money, honey. You don't got to show me the money. I know you're going to do it. You've done it time and time again. That's why I love that David, when he killed Goliath, what did he do? After he killed Goliath, he took the head of Goliath everywhere he went. And I believe that he was showing people, if God did it for me once, he can do it for me again. If he did it to this giant, then he'll do it to any other giant that's trying to rise up against the family of God, against the army of God. I'm going to hold Goliath's head up high and say, if God did a miracle one time, if he brought me through one mountain, if he brought me through one giant, if he brought me through one problem, if he brought me through one grandchild that's not saved, if he brought me through one son or daughter that's drug addicted and saved them, then I know that I I know that I know that he can do it again. Amen. Tell your neighbor, praise him on credit. Not debit. It's really true. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. He recognized and gave glory to God. Man, sometimes we just got to recognize with a grateful heart what he's already done. He set you free. He picked you up out of the miry clay, set your feet on solid rock to stay. He's enough and he's worthy. When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John, where many were gathered for prayer. So these are, this is when the Bible said that the church was praying earnestly, this is what it was talking about. He went to the home where they were praying earnestly, and he knocked at the door in the gate, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. When she recognized Peter's jo voice, she was overjoyed. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was overjoyed. You know why? Because when God breaks somebody out and when God does a miracle and revival breaks out and when, it, when somebody breaks out, somebody says it's breakout time. When it's breakout time, it's time to rejoice. When it's breakout time, it's time for the church to be overjoyed. When it's breakout time, it's time for the church to praise. And this woman was oh, so overjoyed that instead of opening the door for Peter, she ran back inside and told everybody, Peter's standing at the door. You're out of your mind, they said. This goes back to what we said. They couldn't believe what God had done. When she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. See, even the church gave recognition to God. They knew that it had to have been the act of God. But it really was Peter. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. When they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. He motioned for them to quiet down and told them how the Lord had led him out of prison. Can I tell you that every time that God does a miracle, every time that God breaks you out, every time that God comes through in your life, every time that the church prays earnestly and something happens, it's time for you to testify it's time for you to testify. The Bible says the first thing that Peter did, he motioned for them to quiet down and he told them how the Lord had led him out of prison. 
And the move of God will stop if we stop testifying about what God is doing in our lives. The move of God will stop if we don't take what God is doing here in Portland Congregational into the streets of Brockton, into the streets of Dunkirk, into the streets of wherever we go and testify. The move of God will stay here. And we won't be a church on the move. We won't be a church on the move. We'll be stagnant. We'll, be, we'll, be, we'll play flashlight tag here all day. Everybody's just shining their lights at each other. You got a light? Oh, my light's brighter than yours. My light's so bright, I could blind somebody. And, and, and it's all in, in-house. When God has called us to be an outreach, D- didn't Jesus tell us it's not the healthy that need a doctor? It's the sick that need a doctor? I came to seek and save that which was lost. I came to proclaim the good news and to set the captive free. It's time for us to go out into the world, preach the gospel to every creature, and go and testify about what God is doing in our life. We got it. Somebody say, you got to testify. Come on, turn to the person next to you and say, you got to testify. Then turn to your second option and tell them you got to testify. He motioned for them to quiet down, told them how the Lord had let them out of prison. This, this week, I challenge, I challenge you, church. I challenge you to tell somebody how the Lord led you out of prison. Maybe not physical bars, but bondage in your mind, bondage of sin. Tell somebody how the Lord led you out of prison. And then he said this, tell James and the other brothers what happened, he said. And then he went to another place. At dawn, there was a great commotion among the soldiers about what had happened to Peter. So Peter breaks out, and everybody's wondering what's going on with Peter. And King Herod Agrippa ordered a thorough search for him. Can I tell you the devil's searching for you? Somebody tell your person next to you, say, the devil's searching for you. Ever since God set you free, the devil has been searching for you. I came to tell somebody today, ever since God set you free, the devil has been prowling around, the Bible says, as a roaring lion. So he's not a roaring lion because we serve the lion of the tribe of Judah. We serve the lion and the lamb. So we serve the, the, the triple OG original lion. We serve the true one and only God lion, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But the devil prowls around as a roaring lion. And he's always searching and seeking who he can devour. And so they're searching for Peter, trying to find out how he got free. And the devil, ever since you gave your life to the Lord, has been doing the same for you. And then it says this. Herod Agrippa ordered a thorough search for him when he couldn't be found. And he interrogated the guards and sentenced them to death. He interrogated all the guards that were holding Peter. This is spiritual because I want you to think deeper. Think deeper than what we're reading. This is spiritual. Because when God set you free from the darkness that had you bound, the devil started to interrogate that darkness that was supposed to kill you. When God set you free from that prison cell, and when God delivered you, and when God saved you, the devil had a meeting. And said, who let this person go? They were supposed to be dead. I wanted them to be down and out. I wanted them to be broken their whole life. I wanted what happened to them to keep them down and quiet the rest of their life. Who set them free? It's deeper than just a story. It's spiritual. Imagine what it was like when Pastor Josh gave his life to the Lord. Set free, right? God set you free from everything that had you bound. And here's the thing is God knew you'd be here today leading. Imagine what that scene was like in hell. Imagine what that scene was like when the demons were getting interrogated. Well, I thought you were supposed to get them. I thought you were supposed to take out their family. Now look, they're going to start a church and they're going to go help build the church with Pastor Spiller. It's going to be crazy. They're going to tear our kingdom down. I came to tell you that when God sets people free and the church prays earnestly and when we begin to break out, it punishes hell and hell begins to get interrogated. We crush hell for a living and the devil can't stop what God is doing. 
That's what revival will do. That's what revival will do. Revival is supposed to punish hell. I got some demons in trouble when I gave my life to the Lord. I get demons in trouble every city I go to because I travel a lot. And when we go there, I, I'm, I'm coming off the plane, and I'm already beginning to pray. God, I pray that you would shift this city. I pray that you would set people free tonight at the event. I pray, God, that your spirit would break chains, God. I pray that revival would break out. I'm getting demons in trouble. Amen. They're going back to the devil, and they're supposed to be on their assignment, and all they can tell the devil is there's somebody who came into town, and, and ever since they came into town, I have no authority in that area. I have no power in that area because they take dominion everywhere they go, and so I'm getting the devil in trouble. I'm putting the devil on notice in my family. That's what happens. That's what happens when the church prays earnestly, when breakout time starts to happen, when revival breaks out, it punishes hell and it crushes hell. If we could get the worship team to come up now. That's what we do. The Bible says, Jesus said, I'm going to raise up a church that the gates of hell, upon this rock, I will build the church, and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. We don't fight against flesh and blood. The fight is not physical. This is a spiritual fight. And if you don't learn that you're in a war, if you don't learn that you're in a battle, you're going to miss things. You're going to miss signals. You're going to miss what's going on. you got to understand that this is a fight. You remember what Paul said at the end of his life? I what? I fought the good fight. Paul said, I fought the good fight and I finished the race. And I love that he says the good fight, Pastor Spiller. Because have you ever paid for pay-per-view to watch a boxing match or something? And all of a sudden, you get your popcorn ready and you're right there on your couch and you're ready for this awesome fight that you paid $50 for. Now it's $75. And you get all ready and you're sitting there and you're on your couch and then before you can even blink, somebody gets knocked out in the first round. You're like, I paid $50 for this fight? This wasn't even a fight. This guy didn't even stand a chance. But Paul was saying the opposite. Paul was saying that me and the devil, we had a good fight. Paul was saying that throughout my lifetime, I threw some blows at the devil. He threw some blows back at me. I hit the devil. He hit my family sometimes. But I can say one thing, that it was a good fight, and I fought it with all of my heart. I don't know about you, but I want to be like Paul and say, I fought the good fight. Knock him out. And say, I had some exchanges with the devil. You know, I've never liked to play the bench. I played sports all my life. Pastor Josh, you played sports. And I've never liked to play the bench. I never liked to play the bench because I always wanted to be on the field in the game. And I'm afraid we suffer in, in the kingdom of God a little bit from, you, there's this bench mentality. A lot of people want to play the bench. No, you go, brother. You go fight the fight. And I'll sit here and I'll pray for you. I need some brothers and sisters that are going to say, I'll get in the fight with you. I'll start praying with you. I'll fast with you. I'll throw some blows with you because I want to fight the good fight too. When I played football and I wasn't in the game, when I would, they, they would take me out for a few plays, I would go right up to where my coach was at. My coach would be standing right here and I'd put my, I'd put my jersey number right in front of him. And he'd be trying to watch the game and I'm like, you see my number, it's ready. I'm ready, I want to be in the game. And he knew it, so he'd always move me out the way. And then before you know it, after a while, he just throw me in because I was annoying him. And I feel like I do the same thing with God. God, put me in the game. God, I don't want to just be comfortable here on the sidelines. God, I don't want just something that's going to be normal. I don't want to live an average life. Put me in the game. You see my jersey. You see the numbers on the back of my jersey. I'm ready to go in the game, and I'm ready to score some points on the devil's kingdom, and I'm ready to tear the devil's kingdom down. Tell your neighbor, I'm not playing the bench no more. Tell your neighbor, I'm not playing the bench no more. I'm getting in the game. We got to be willing to be like Paul. See, I fought the good fight. My mom used to tell me when we were kids, we used to fight, me and my brother. And uh, she might get some criticism for this. 
But when we, would, when we would start pushing, you know the beginning stages of a fight where you don't really want to fight, but you're acting like you're tough. So you push and then they push you back. And it's this pushing match and both people really don't want to fight. Well, my mom, when me and my brothers would do that, my brother Danny, I'd push him, he pushed me. And my mom, was, we would be in the car pushing. And, and one time I remember clearly, she stops the car and pulls over. And me and Danny just looked at each other like, what, what happened, mom? And she gets out of the car and she opens the door and she goes, you guys aren't going to play games. If you're going to fight, get out of this car and fight right here, right now. And me and my brother were like, I don't really want to fight you, you know? <laughs> this is like, it just got serious really fast. This escalated very quickly. But she was teaching us not to talk the talk, but to walk the walk. And I could say that I, I take that seriously spiritually now. I'm not just going to push the devil. I'm not just going to nudge the devil and play this back and forth game where he's hitting my family and he's attacking me and then I, I push his kingdom a little bit and then he pushes me back a little bit. No, if I'm going to fight, I'm going to fight for real. If I'm going to be in the match, then I'm going to throw some blows and I'm going to give it everything I got. Even if I get knocked down, at least I can say that I gave it everything that I had. Joe Montana, I just read a quote. Everybody know Joe Montana, famous football player? He said, all that I care about at the end of every game, whether I lose or I win, I just want to be able to say that I gave it everything I had. And I took that quote and I said, man, that, that's what I want to say, is whether I lose some battles or whether I win battles, I want to be able to say that I gave God everything that I had. I want to be able to tell God that I gave him all of my life. I gave him all of my obedience. I gave him my family. I gave him my finances. I gave him my obedience and I said, Lord, it's yours. And it, thank you, Jesus, for today, Father. We praise you. We glorify you, mighty God. Thank you for your calling, God. Who you are in our lives, Jesus. You are worthy of all of our praise. God, I pray that we would be a church on fire, God. Like that song says, a soul on fire. Till I am a soul on fire. I just pray that we would be those people, God, that answers the call. That, 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 that are willing to lay down our lives for your glory and for the gospel and for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Pray that we would be those people. We love you. We thank you, Father. You're worthy, Jesus. I gave my life to the Lord when I was 15 years old. I let go of everything. I let go and let God. And what He has done in my life has been better than anything that I could have ever imagined. It's the greatest decision that I ever made to give my life to the Lord was the greatest decision that I ever made and he's done wondrous things and I came to tell our, our young people in this place when you give your life to the Lord he'll take you places you never imagined he's been able to use me to preach the gospel around the world he's been able to use me to create music for him he's been able to use me to do so many great things but it's because I decided to give my life to Jesus so give your life to Christ today Father God we love you we praise you give you all the glory and all the honor we all say amen amen praise God thank you so much